Psalm 121. Psalm 121. A song of degrees. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. So far we read, may he bless his word to us. Summarized in those first two stanzas, the first two verses, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. When it says it's a song of degrees, another way to say that is it's an, a song of the ascent, of an ascent, of a climb. And the reference in Psalm 120 through 134, all of them are called a song of degrees. These are the songs which the children of Israel would sing as they were making their journey from their homes up to Jerusalem, to where the temple was, where they would celebrate those annual feast days. So it was song, sung by them during that kind of a journey, as we implied earlier. A wearying journey. A journey that was not easy for them because it was often on foot. But they wanted, they wanted to know what God's relationship to them was. What did God think of them? What was God's relationship to them? And that's what they would find primarily in the temple. As they did that, though, they found, well, they found that it was typical of them, just as it is of us, that they would look at Jerusalem as a place of security. And it was because the city of Jerusalem, with its high walls, was built on seven hills. And the temple was on one of those seven hills, and the palace of the king on another. And when the children of Israel would be attacked, then the people from the villages and the countries and the plains would often go to Jerusalem. There's where they would find protection. And so the Hebrew expresses the first verse as a question. And that's why I tried to read it in that way. Does our help come from the hills, from the high walls of Jerusalem? And every Psalter number reflects that accurately because that's versified with a, as a question. And it's a rhetorical question. And the question is, the answer to that question is, no, no. 
Our help is not in hills and in high walls. And the answer is in verse 2. Our help is in the name of Jehovah. The child of God is on a journey. First Peter, as an epistle, is often called the Pilgrim's Epistle. And it's a description of the child of God who from regeneration begins a journey. A journey to the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. That journey is characterized by many difficulties. Acts 14 makes a beautiful summary of that, or an accurate summary. Maybe it's not so beautiful. The Apostle Paul and Barnabas, when they finished the first missionary journey, went back and visited the cities that they had been preaching in and experienced some persecution in. And even though they had, at some of the places, shaken the dust off their feet, as they're going back through Antioch, Lystra, and Iconium, they confirmed the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. And then this. And now it's obvious that the writer, Dr. Luke, was with them because he then says, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom. The journey, the pilgrim journey, is going to be characterized by afflictions. Afflictions that make the road and the path hard. Often when we think of difficulties, we think of diseases, we think of conflicts, we think of deaths of loved ones, we think of loved ones who aren't converted. There's different shapes to the crosses that God gives to us. A lot of times, we try to take those difficulties and put them in a box. Yeah, they're there, and they're real, but we've, we've got fun too. We've got other times where we can forget them, and put them aside, and, and we're going to have our, our day. We like to have time of fun, especially is that true in our youth like to forget them and, and think often that if I don't think about them, then my life isn't so bad. But as we grow older, we find out that the presence of these difficulties are gifts that our Lord gives to us in order to to make us find Him. Why do we tuck them in a box? Because they're hard. We don't want to deal with them. But the Lord makes us deal with them. And in one way or another, we see their reality and their weight. and our weakness. And that's when we're ready to say, I can't. And often, that's exactly the way that God, our Heavenly Father, is there to catch us, is there to teach us, is there to show to us, you're right, you can't, you never could. But I can. 
know me. Look, look at me. It's even possible to walk on water, as Peter did, both to Christ and when he pulled him up. And with Christ holding his hand, he could walk on that water back to the ship. So in all kinds of ways, God calls us to look and to realize, and this is often how it goes, we have to see our weakness in order to see His strength. Because we look to hills. We look to our abilities. We look to our wit. We look to what others can do for us. We look at ourselves. And God will let us do that until we learn, I can't. It is too heavy. It is too hard. I am too weak. Psalm 39. Let me know the number of my days, that I may know how frail I am. We don't like to pray that. We don't think that's the, the right way to pray. But the Lord will bring us to that position. Now, if we focus on the fact that our battle isn't just, our life is not just a walking in a difficult way, but we realize even more that the walk of a child of God is that of striving while he's carrying an old man to live to the glory of God, to do what's right, to be godly and holy in every part of his life. And he's striving, striving rightly motivated out of gratitude, not in order to be saved, but in the knowledge that he is saved, he strives to do that for the glory of God. And he wants to do what's right. He's committed, his theology is correct, his co conviction of the doctrines of Scripture and the Reformed faith is accurate, but it's precisely in that way that he's striving to thank him and to do it in a way that would honor and glorify God in a life that's right, and then, every night, Satan is so strong, and he catches me, catches me when I'm not looking, and he knocks me down. And again, the battle to do that which is right and pleasing in the sight of God is a wearying struggle. The hills and the ravines of Palestine could be very slippery. The walk that God would have us walk is that there's pitfalls everywhere we look. And the reality is that when we put ourselves to bed at night, and if we are in the practice of kneeling down before our beds, at our bedside, or we do it some other way, and we look back at that day, we didn't do it. Loaded with sin. And if we follow the nature that, that says, but I want to, and we think that we failed, then the devil's got a grip on us again. And the, the language that God would have us to have is this. It's not whether you can do it. It's not whether you can even thank me correctly. And it's almost as if God comes to us every day and he says, you keep trying, but do you realize that you keep failing? 
And if you think that you've got to do it, you're going to fail. And the Lord's language is, would you just look at me? Look at who I am, look at what I have done, and look at what I promise. Look at who I am, look at what I have done, and look at what I promise. Who is he? His name is Jehovah. Our help is in Jehovah. Psalm 124, as we recited it, our help is in the name of Jehovah. In Exodus 3, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And that's when he highlighted this name. It had been used before in earlier passages of Scripture, but it was in Exodus 3 that, that God told Moses, you have to go to the children of Israel and you have to tell them, get ready. And you tell together, all together, you tell Pharaoh, let my people go. When Moses asked God in Exodus 3, you're sending me to a people that I really have hardly ever lived with. Maybe for the first few years of my life, my mother nursed me among them. But then for the rest of the 40, till I was 40, I was in the palace of Pharaoh. They knew me as an Israelite, but when I tried to deliver them and killed a man in order to begin a deliverance when I thought it was time that God wanted to use me to get out. They turned against me. They didn't want me. And you want me to go back to them? And I've been away from them for another 40 years. How are they going to know me? Who shall I tell them hath sent me? God out of the burning bush said to him, I am that I am. You tell the people Israel, my people, that I am hath sent you. Jehovah. The most powerful part of the name Jehovah. And he makes us look at him. Who is he? He's Jehovah. I am means that he is the perfectly self-sufficient, self-existent, self-reliant one. He has everything he needs himself. He is totally independent. He did not create because he needed to create. He has everything. He's the living God, the one true living God. That three in one gives him a life. He's got a relationship and a fellowship inside himself that's absolutely blissful, filled with love, perfect. Doesn't need us. When you guys want to say to them, I need you. And you think that that's a way to tell them that you love them? You are putting on them a tremendous burden that they would hope they might be able to fulfill, but they can't. And they know that. I tried it. Don't work. It's not the right way to say, I love you. But you have a God who doesn't need you. He doesn't choose you because he needs you. He's lacking something. He doesn't adopt us into his family because now he's going to have a family. No, he's got a perfect family inside himself. Father, son. He has everything. But when he comes outside of himself and he chooses unto himself a people, that he will take to himself for his own sake. 
That's when you are really loved. He doesn't need us. But he takes us to himself anyway. Then I know I belong to him. He chose me. He took me. He makes me his own. And then when he says, as self-sufficient, self-reliant, self-dependent as he is, then he adds, and I made a promise to your father Abraham 430 years ago. One day is as a thousand years. What's 430 years to God? Generations had passed. But he says, I change not. When I make a relationship, it is permanent and it is sure. You go up, you go down. I am always the same. And when I elected you and chose you to be mine, don't think of that as an activity that took place once and then it's finished. In our perspective it is, but in his, his choosing is something that the eternal God never stops doing. He never stops doing. He is always in his first love as he reaches out and takes us unto himself and embraces us in his Son. It's a constant reality. That's why he is ever faithful. That's why he changes not. Because he never stops doing what he's always done. In eternity, he never started to love you. He always did. As long as he's been, you have been in his mind. In this relationship, This God is Jehovah. That's his name. Now the people, remember, are on their journey. They're on their ascent to the hill and to the temple. That, the, the, the temple, the only one place in all of the world and in all the land of Canaan where it would be, that one building. They come to that building and under the one roof, Two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place. But they're together. Oh, yeah, there's a veil. But they're together. They're under the same roof. They're in the same building, the church. In the candlestick, in the table of showbread, in the altar of incense. The holy of holies with the ark of the covenant, Christ. God, God and his people together. Temple. And how do you get in that, that temple? You have to go past outside in front on the east side. The only entrance is the altar of burnt offerings. Not the kind of smells that you had when you walked into the house. If you have a self over operating oven or it started before you went to church and you smell that meat roasting. Now you smell burnt flesh. Stinky. Animals dying. Bloodshed sprinkled on the outside of that altar. And an animal being burnt. And you learned that the only way into this room to be with God was through the sacrifice. Somebody died and had to die for that relationship to be possible. And you know his name is Jehovah? You know his other name? Emmanuel. We don't have a temple. 
We don't have to go to Jerusalem. We have Emmanuel. We celebrated his birth, but the reality is that God is with us. So that at least his confession of faith, he's the one who upholds us with the right hand of his righteousness and he holds our right hand with his left to keep us near his side. He goes with us through every step and every trial and every difficulty. There he is, faithful in his relationship, so that the veil that separated them is down. It's not there anymore. We're under the same room now. Together. Jehovah has established a relationship that is forever the same. My sins rise up against me prevailing day by day. But there he is, showing mercy. I've not changed. I chose you. I'm still choosing you. I gave my son. Now, today in this dispensation, we would talk about God as the one who gave his son. It's really not any different. But in the old dispensation, you have this expression that God is the maker of heaven and earth. Over and over and over we sang of it as it was versified in Psalm 102. We sang it as it is put that way in Psalm 104. Bear with me. Just catch the emphasis that is placed on this thought in only one book, Isaiah 37. Isaiah 37, verse 16. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubim, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Familiar words, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, Jehovah, catch it, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, and there is no searching of his understanding. Isaiah 45, verse 12. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and, the, and his Maker, Ask me the things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me, I made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have I commanded. Isaiah 48, verse 13. Mine hand hath also laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. Some of you have gone to planetariums, and especially in the Creation Museum, there's that, that picture of the planetarium where it starts out and you see something on the earth, and it backs up, and it backs up, and it backs up. And the person is small, and the earth is small, and the solar system is small. And God says, my hand is wider. It spans the heavens. Your God is that great. One more out of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 10, chapter 9, verse 6. Let me read it, the, what, what he starts. This is what the Levites would put forth. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. All our praise is exceeded by his glory. His glory exceeds everything we give to Him. Thou art exalted above all blessing and praise. And then this. Thou, even Thou, art Jehovah alone. 
Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things that are in there, all therein, the seas and all that are therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. That wonderful, tremendously wonderful work of God is not only a display of his greatness and of his power, but in Proverbs 3, but also Psalm 104, verse 24, it's a display of his wisdom. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. When, when the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, describes God as the maker of heaven and earth, then our minds must immediately run to his greatness, to his power, to not only call it in existence, but to keep it in existence, and his wisdom to put all the things that are in the creation to work together. And, and just look at the marvel, I was going to say, of a body, of a finger. Just how everything in there works perfectly, in harmony, so in all of creation. What wisdom that God that you say here at Grace at the beginning of every worship service, our help is in the name of Jehovah the Lord who made heaven and earth. Then think of the greatness, the power, and the wisdom of your help. Who he is, what he has done, and what he promises to be your help and your keeper to be our help. Again, I could go through verse after verse that uses that expression. Deuteronomy 33, 27 and 29. 2 Chronicles 25, verse 8. Listen, Psalm 27, verse 9. Psalm 28, verse 7. Psalm 33, 20. Psalm 37, 40. And I could keep going. He's our help. He's been our help. He is our help. The emphasis of the word help is that someone is giving aid by surrounding you in order to defend you. That's the picture of help. All the Hebrew words are pictures. You're standing there and he is surrounding you to keep you and preserve you and be your help against all those that are opposed to you and are assaulting you. Keeper. Six times in this short chapter, all by itself, six times this word is used. I am your keeper. I have set a watch over you. I am your protector. I am your preserver. I will preserve you. Six times to make sure that we get it so that it takes away our fears. What anxiety can survive, someone said, these repeated promises? I am your keeper. I am your helper. You are who? Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Not in yourselves, but in Him. And when He calls you beloved, you are loved. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you want proof of that? Then look at the cross. Look at his life. Look at what he suffered. Look at what he did. 
Look at all that He did for even you. And now He says, I am your help and your shield and your keeper. Know me. Know my promises. Why look at self? Why look this morning we had wine. Why look at wine? Why look at drugs? Why look at another human? Why look at hills and walls? No one is in more danger than one who is self-secure. No one is so safe as one who knows that Jehovah is his keeper true. And then he ends forevermore. Forever. He won't stop. There's no pause. He doesn't get tired. He's always your keeper. Every second. At night and during the day. Sun and moon. That's your confession. Say it. Say it over and over and over and over. Do I look to hills? No, my help is in Jehovah, who made the heavens and the earth. And that's the beauty of the reply that we make to God when He says, Beloved, in the Lord Jesus Christ, my help, our help. Now the psalmist says, My. That's you, Kaylee. That's every single one. You say it. To yourself, I, my help, is in the name of Jehovah. And then our help is in the name of Jehovah, who made the heavens and the earth. Amen. We thank thee, Father. What else can we say? All of our other words falter and stumble and fail. But thou dost give us promise after promise and every reason to hope and to have good hope because thou wilt take care of us as we bear the afflictions of this present life until we go home to be with Father. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Bless us with this assurance Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Amen.